want to talk about the Establishment Clause in this lecture and make a distinction as we did with the Free Exercise Clause. The Establishment Clause jurisprudence that, I'm, that I will talk about in this lecture changes sig in significant ways in the 20th century. But there's still kind of a, 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 of a, of a foundational distinction that's made within establishment cases. And it's one that makes all the difference sometimes as almost a threshold question. And that's whether the Establishment Clause really prohibits only just the establishment of a national religion, you know, with a cathedral and those sorts of things, or if other actions by national and then after incorporation state governments de facto establish a religion. In other words, without formally saying we are a, that the national religion is, is Christianity or, or Catholicism or some form of Christianity, um, but instead whether some actions taken by national and state governments have the effect of creating that kind of environment. It's a big distinction to make. Some people are on the side where they believe that the Establishment Clause only prevents the national government from putting up a big church in, in Washington, D.C., saying this is the official religion of the United States. Others, though, take it further and interpret it more capaciously, more widely and say that other actions, again, taken by the state can, in effect, create a system or create a, a, a political space where we have established uh, a religion. The Establishment Clause is incorporated against the states and therefore gets its highest level of protection uh, in 1947 in a, in a case called Everson versus the Board of Education of New Jersey. And this is a case that falls into one of three changing categories that Establishment Clause cases have followed in the 20th century. The Everson case, the, when, when the Establishment Clause is incorporated against the states, that ushers in a time that we call strict neutrality. Uh, and when you read the language of that case, which I'll tell you about in a second, there, there, is, there is an argument for, for, for being neutral towards uh, religion. Um, in, in the 1960s, it becomes even stricter, in a sense, becomes what we call strict separation. Uh, but by the 19, early 1970s, there's more of what we call accommodationism. In other words, um, not uh, the, the court allowing some governmental action to take place that um, where before it would have been considered an establishment of religion, but is more accommodating to religion. So in Everson, when the Establishment Clause was applied to the state, this was the challenge. Um, how do we, or should we, should the state of New Jersey fund the transportation of non-public school students to school? Particularly, the majority of non-public school students in the state of New Jersey, where this was an issue, were parochial, in other words, Catholic schools. Um, much like when I was a little boy, I would go and get subsidized tokens to ride the trolley and the subway to my Catholic school. Here, the question was whether that's constitutional or not, whether or not that violates the Establishment Clause. And again, this is one of those, this is one of those uh, uh, cases that deals with an understanding of the Establishment Clause as something beyond mere physical establishment of a religion. Here, it's where the actions of the state or national government can, some would argue, create the impression that there is an establishment. So in other words, whether funding this supports the church. And funding, direct funding to churches would be a no-no. It would violate the Establishment Clause. Well, the court said that this did not violate the Establishment Clause because the funding for the money that went to buy tokens or to, or to put the, the, the quarter into the, uh, into the machine on the bus for these students to go to school um, was given directly to parents. The money was not given to the school. So the court was able to sidestep that. Nevertheless, this is the case where the court um, brings up or resurrects Jefferson's comments about a wall of separation between church and state uh, in Everson. Well, forward uh, about a decade and a half uh, to the early 1960s, when we get um, the most restrictions on establishment issues, in other words, where the court is extremely 
um, leery of any kind of action taken by states that might even a little bit um, seem to favor one religion because that would in effect, the court argued in the 1960s, de facto establish a religion. Uh, and in the seminal case of Engel versus Vitali in 1962, this is the case that everyone tells you uh, was the case that took God out of the public schools. This was in New York, this is a case out of New York, the New York State uh, Legislature, its, its education system required the reading of a Bible passage every morning, public school students. Um, the parents of, uh, of, of a student challenged this as violating the Establishment Clause, and the court agreed. Right? The big majority agreed that this violated the Establishment Clause. Now, one of the things that we should see here is that the court starts to recognize, and we don't have time to go through the language that the court used in this case in, 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 in justifying that this violated the Establishment Clause, but they were particularly concerned about, again, two things. One, the actions, the official actions of government with respect to religion, that, if, if, they, take a, if, if they take an action, say, to read specifically, to read the King James Bible, that, the court says, de facto establishes, at the very least, a preference for a certain kind of religion as opposed to another one or as opposed to none at all. The second was these cases, and a lot of them involve children, is something that we should understand as uh, we're going to see this um, develop pretty consistently, even though the court as a whole is going to be more accommodating toward, toward, toward religion, that the court is particularly concerned about, um, about minors and about the, the potential coercion that goes on um, during a prayer. Uh, and some justices, certainly in the 60s, and then we'll see it again in the early 1990s, the majority of them, uh, will agree uh, that state-mandated prayer, things like that, state, any kind of state action dealing with religion, that puts especially minors in a position where they might feel coerced or they might feel that um, that by not praying or not taking the action that the majority is taking um, is problematic. Um, they'll even go so far in the 1990s to talk about psychological coercion. Um, and the dissents, particularly Scalia, really, really, really bang them up on that. Um, so, so again, we have to understand the, the two important parts here. Uh, one is state action, when the state is explicitly taking an action that might seem to favor one religion over another or religion over non-religion. Uh, and here, in this case at least, uh, with minors. Um, the next development, though, comes in the early 1970s. Uh, the Warren Court is, is over. Uh, we have the Burger Court. Uh, uh, the revolution that wasn't, everybody thought that the Burger Court was going to overturn everything that the Warren Court had done in the 1960s. Uh, they, they overturned some things, uh, but for the most part, things stay uh, pretty much the same. Um, but there is more accommodation, and that's what we call accommodationism, uh, with respect to religion uh, from, the, from the court's perspective. And they first come up with uh, um, a test uh, to determine uh, whether or not um, some kind of state action with respect to religion uh, violates the Establishment Clause in 19, a 1971 case called Lemon versus Kurtzman, uh, which produces the famous Lemon Test, uh, which is still used by some justices today uh, they pick and choose whether or not they're going to use it at certain times and, and not others. Uh, but the lemon test was designed to be more accommodating to religion, not to be as, as, as black and white as the court had been in the 1960s um, about the, the potential interaction between um, religion and the state. Um, you, you know, the justices were, were making very rational, pragmatic arguments that we, a complete separation is impossible between church and state just as a practical matter. At the same time, we want to make sure that there isn't uh, some kind of interaction. There might be a point at which that interaction is dangerous and might, and might uh, run afoul of the Establishment Clause. So how can we be more accommodating um, and at the same time uh, draw some line in the sand? Um, after all, the Constitution, the First Amendment does prohibit the establishment of religion. So there has to be some point at which that would happen. Right? Well, this is a case where um, in where the state, where a state was providing uh, subsidies to Catholic schools uh, for their lay teachers teaching lay subjects using lay textbooks. So imagine a Catholic school 
with, a, with not a nun or, or a priest, but um, a, a lay person teaching US history with a, the, the same US history textbook that's being used by the public school down the street. Shouldn't there be some kind of subsidy so these Catholic kids get the books that they need, that there isn't some kind of um, disparity in, in the ability to hire good teachers, because public schools might pay more, uh, and that sort of thing. Well, the court here, while being very accommodating, and, and, and they come up with this three-part test, and, and it's designed to be accommodating, but they strike this down. They strike this kind of thing down in the state. Um, and they develop a three-part test to determine whether um, an interaction or some kind of relationship between church and the state um, is, is violative of the Establishment Clause. And there's three, there's, so there's three questions um, that the court's going to ask when they're asked to determine whether a particular statute or a particular kind of relationship violates the Establishment Clause. They'll first ask uh, whether the, the law has a, has a secular purpose to it. The law has to have a secular purpose. The second thing that they'll ask, or, or they'll look at, is that the law cannot have the primary effect of advancing or prohibiting religion. And the third thing that they'll look at is that this relationship cannot result in an excessive entanglement between government and religion. Right? Not in any kind of entanglement, but an excessive entanglement. Right? So you can see in the language there that, that they are trying to be more accommodating to the relationship. Um, an example here, and, and this is a way uh, some justices have made the argument about um, being very strict when it comes to establishment, um, is that you, churches don't want funding. In churches, you shouldn't want funding from the state or interaction because you don't want them to have the reciprocal right to come in and look at your books or to, or, or to tie strings or, or, or to, to your actions. Uh, that separation is better. Excessive entanglement right, between church uh, and state. We're recording, you can't ask a question right now. Primary effect, it cannot have the primary effect of advancing or prohibiting religion. So, since Lemon, the court really has been more accommodating to religion. But certain justices have been more persuaded by Lemon than others. And, and that's really where we are today. We're in, we're, we're, we're in a flux. Um, we're, 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 we're certainly not sailing in one consistent direction uh, when it comes to the Establishment Clause, although for the most part the court is uh, more accommodating than it had been in the 1960s. Um, and some justices, um, for example, have seemingly opposite views about the issue. Um, for example, Justice Kennedy, um, ruled for the majority, saying it was all right to have a nativity scene on, in the front of a, of, a, of a city building in a town. But at the same time, in a case from 1992 called Lee versus Weissman, uh, in which a, a, a rabbi came and gave a benediction at a high school graduation, he ruled, and again, think about this in terms of, of, of these as young adults. He ruled that that was unconstitutional um, and that the students there who may not have wanted to participate in that prayer or in that ceremony um, might have been psychologically coerced to do so. So again, we're, we're still in a state of flux. And even justices who rule one way on an issue like a nativity scene can also see the Establishment Clause um, in a very, very different way. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.